thank you for the invitation. It's always a, a pleasure to be at uh, CWI. Indeed, in this talk, I will um, try to bring together two different topics in uh, sequential decision making with bandits. And I will try to unify them through an algorithmic lens called Thomson sampling. So Thomson sampling is a Bayesian algorithm, and as such, it is of more commonly applied to parametric data. But my, my focus in this talk will be to try to tackle non-parametric bandit problems. So the, uh, the work I will be mentioned uh, come from collaboration with uh, two uh, great PhD students, Dorian and Marc, two colleagues from INRIA Lille, Odalric and Rémy, and also with uh, Rianne de Heide, who is now at the VU Amsterdam. So what is a bandit problem? So it's like you saw this morning for those attending the bootcamp, this Markov decision uh, process model. So a bandit model can be seen as an MDP with just one state in which we would repeatedly be facing the same action. But the outcome of this action are still modeled uh, randomly. So a bandit model is simply a collection of k uh, probability distributions that I denote by uh, new one up to new k. And then there is this uh, important sequential data acquisition process. Uh, that's, uh, so in each time step t, this stands for the decision times, you select one of this uh, distribution called arm, and you get to observe a sample from that arm that is often called uh, a reward. Uh, and so the way you choose uh, your arms is what you could optimize for a different uh, performance measure. This is what we call the algorithms or the sequential strategy or the sampling rule. And the constraint is that the way you choose uh, action uh, or arm uh, 80 plus 1 can only depend on the past observed uh, arm. So the past information collected, so the arm A1 up to A T that you've sampled before, and the sample X1 up to X T uh, that you uh, gather. Of course, you're also able to use randomized strategy uh, if you want, materialized by this uh, random variable UT. And also, to have a good algorithm, it is often um, of use to know what type of reward distribution you are uh, actually uh, facing. And this is a bit that we will try to, to work on uh, in this talk. So just for those who never heard about bandits, the name comes from an old land for a slot machine. So you assume yourself in a casino with a row of slot machines. And unlike this octopus, you are not able to sample all of them at the same time. So you have to pick which slot machine you want to, uh, to see. And so bandits were uh, introduced in uh, the statistic communities a long time ago, like in the uh, 1950s with the work uh, of Robbins, and even before with Thompson sampling that we will be talking uh, about. And then it was, it was picked up by the machine learning community in the 2000s with a lot of uh, uh, new and interesting uh, contribution. And the reason for the renewed interest in bandits uh, comes from actually plenty of application in the context of uh, uh, typically online content optimization. And so I will walk you through a, a simple example, also to serve an, as an example of the two kind of problem we are going to talk about in this talk. So here I am a company trying to optimize my uh, revenue of item I sell online. And my uh, expert in marketing tell me like, that the impact of how, how my website look like can uh, change the revenue I get. So in particular, uh, the marketing team come up with uh, several versions of the web page, and then they want to uh, try them in order to decide which one uh, is the best, or just to maximize the revenue. So to have a simple uh, probabilistic model, we will assume that um, the, each of the versions has some probability to generate a target event. So typically, the user who sees it ends up buying a product. Uh, and then the marketing campaign goes as follows. Uh, for each new visitor, you will choose which version of the web page uh, you will display. And then you will observe whether the user has bought a product or not uh, when, uh, when he saw it. So the first objective of the company is to maximize their uh, revenue. So typically here, maximizing the, the reward is maximizing the number of products you bought. So, so it's something good. So because we use uh, 
a random model. Uh, we will consider here a criterion in expectation. Bob is no longer here to, to criticize me, and the risk measure will, uh, will come later, uh, I promise you. But so the most typical objective, just like in re reinforcement learning, is this notion of expected cumulated uh, reward. So this is indeed a particular reinforcement learning problem in a one-state MDP where you, you consider a reward up to, uh, up to time t. But actually, the company, okay, is maximizing profit, but in practice, changing your website for each visitor in real time is a nightmare. So no company wants to be doing that uh, for life in order to maximize their revenue. Instead, they try to organize this so-called A-B testing, or here A-B seed and testing uh, phases where for a while they allow these dynamic changes but then at the end they want to stop in order to display for a very long time for a large amount of users the same version. So in bandit words this is phrased as a best arm identification problem because then you, you care about quickly identifying the page that has the largest probability to generate uh, revenue in order to uh, apply it forever at the end of the testing phase. And so this is often referred to as a pure exploration problem as opposed to the reward maximization problem uh, that we saw. So we will try to present algorithm for both objectives using similar ingredients uh, in this talk. So to go on about uh, the type of distribution that makes sense in the application of bandit problems. So in the marketing example, we always already saw an example of uh, binary feedback. Uh, product bo bought or product uh, not bought. Uh, where it is also common is, uh, at least it's an example to you write, you see this in a paper introduction, is to view bandits as a simple model for a sequential clinical trial. There the arms model the efficacy of different treatments that you are uncertain of at the beginning, and for each patient you could uh, choose a treatment. And then uh, the simplest model is just to say success failure. So we are back to facing Bernoulli uh, rewards distribution in this problem. And here we can also ask ourselves the question, do we want to maximize rewards? Do we want to heal as many people as possible in the process? Or do we want to make it short, find the best arm in order to treat the whole population? So the two problems could be of interest depending on uh, who you ask and the nature of the uh, the disease. So other type of distribution uh, still in this uh, field of uh, online uh, optimization is typically recommender systems where uh, for each user you, you suggest a movie for example and afterwards you ask their opinion and they give you for example a rating which is between one to five stars. So there in this, in this context the distribution is naturally some uh, multinomial uh, distribution for each of the uh, of the movie, but actually in, in different applications. So uh, the, the third item is an uh, application that comes from my colleague Odalric, who is trying to apply sequential uh, decision making in a field where it has been seldom applied before, which is agriculture. So what you want to do is to propose recommendation to farmers, like uh, what fertilization policy, what planting dates, and then the reward is what? It's how much grain do you harvest in the end? It's a yield. And yield distribution, we will see in a few slides, are very complex uh, distribution. Often they are naturally bounded, but they can be multimodal depending on good and bad year. So depending on the application, you have different assumptions that you can make on uh, your data. And my dream would be to have a single algorithm that performs optimally in each of these settings without knowing which settings they are facing. And this is the reason why I want to turn my attention to a uh, non-parametric uh, model. So typically in these three examples, we, are, we have bandit distribution, but we can come up with bandit algorithm for Bernoulli, bandit algorithm for multinomial, but my goal is to optimally adapt to the type of bandit uh, distribution. So for this, I will build on a nice algorithm for uh, solving bandits, which is called uh, Thomson sampling. But before presenting an algorithm, I need to specify a bit more uh, my performance measure. So here we are in the first problem I mentioned, the reward maximization slash reinforcement learning uh, world. 
And so if we want to maximize reward, intuitively, we should be playing as much as possible the arm that I denote by A star, which has the largest mu. And so uh, maxim re uh, maximizing reward amounts to have a large number of selection of uh, this arm. And a common performance measure that is um, used in the bandit literature is to use, uh, to minimize instead some notion of regret. The regret being the difference between the cumulative reward you have with an oracle strategy playing only the best arm. So this is t times mu star minus uh, the expected sum of reward you get with your strategy. And uh, so regret can also be interpreted as the expected sum of the instantaneous error you commit when you choose arm. Uh, so here in my slides, it should be an 80. Uh, when you choose arm 80, uh, instead of choosing the best arm, which has mean mu star. And so uh, it's easy to see that the regret can be rewritten in terms of how many times you have selected uh, each of the arm uh, so far. So what we will, uh, a good algorithm for regret minimization should have a small value of uh, expected number of selection of the suboptimal arm. So in all the future slides, we will only look at this, try to control the number of suboptimal selections that are made by a given uh, bandit algorithm. <coughs> so what would you do if you were in this uh, casino and if you could try the arm uh, in order to uh, play as much as possible uh, the good one? Well, you could do estimation, of course. You would start by pulling each arm once, and from there you can start estimating. So typically you can maintain the simple maximum likelihood estimator, so the average reward that each of the arm uh, gave you. So this is this uh, uh, notation mu at uh, uh, 80, the empirical means of the reward from arm A, which depend on a random number of, uh, of samples. And then you say, okay, I have this hard constraint to maximize reward. Well, I will just pick the arm that looks best so far. So this is a very greedy strategy okay, that we can call uh, follow the leader. And actually, it's quite easy to, to, to see that it can fail in that it can uh, draw a linear number of time uh, bad arms. So for example, if you have two Bernoulli arms, just because of the randomness, the arm that has the largest mean, which is arm one in this example, will give you a zero the first time, whereas arm two gives you a one. Then the empirical mean of the best arm is frozen to zero and you never play it afterwards. So, exploitation is not enough, and indeed, to solve adequately the bandit problem, you need to amount, add the right amount of uh, exploration. In other words, you need to compensate a bit for the uncertainty that is present in your estimate instead of relying only on point estimates. And a way to do that is to adopt a Bayesian modeling where uncertainty is naturally represented by posterior distribution. So, uh, um, in uh, the, the tools that we have in this Bayesian uh, model. So typically here we assume that the arms are independent and the, the parameter of interest, the means, mu a, they are assumed to be drawn from some prior distribution. And after observing some uh, data, so here uh, ya1 up to ya nat, it's the, the previous sample I have from arm a. Those allow me to compute the posterior distribution, like the distribution of mu a, given what I observed. And here I present a graphical illustration on the five arm bandits. So the red diamonds are the means that are unknown. And then uh, you have to flip your head, but there is a distribution uh, of their posterior. So you have, some posterior are very picky because the arm has been sampled a lot, whereas others are more vague if, if there is only, for example, four, R, four sample from uh, arm two. And so the idea of Thompson sampling, having this uh, posterior at hands, uh, can be expressed in uh, several ways. So the way it was put forward in the old paper of 1933 is, okay, it's a randomized strategy where the probability to select an arm is equal to its posterior probability of being the best. Meaning that what is suggested, computationally speaking, is to compute the probability under the Bayesian model that one arm is the best. And so for two arms, concretely, the probability that uh, one beta distribution exceeds another. And so those computations were very hard at the, at the time, uh, actually. 
But another way to implement Thompson sampling, so to have a randomized strategy uh, such that the probability to select arm A is exactly its posterior probability of being the best, is to actually just draw sample from the posterior and then uh, pick the arm that has the largest sample. So this achieves exactly the same as Thompson sampling and it is a modern way uh, that this algorithm is uh, implemented. And so this, as this strategy has been rediscovered, I would say starting in the 2000 under many different names like randomized probability matching, posterior sampling. I also read once the Bayesian learning automaton. So you have different people who rediscovered this, uh, uh, this algorithm. And so you find the whole history and plenty of other applications in this nice tutorial by, uh, by Dan Russo. So just to make sure everyone is uh, on the same page. So the input of Tanson sampling is this choice of prior distribution for each arm. And then in each round to select the arm, as I said, in the simplest uh, implementation, we, we draw one sample that I denote by theta 80 from each of the posterior distribution and then select the arm that gave the largest sample. So for Bernoulli distribution, for example, the typical prior is a uniform prior or some beta prior if you would like to encode uh, some prior knowledge. And then the posterior distribution is a conjugate uh, posterior, which will be the family of beta distribution. So this is a distribution with two parameters. The first one will be the sum of rewards, so the number of one observed. The second will be the number of zero observed in the first trial uh, for this arm. So beta distribution look a bit like this uh, uh, Gaussian sometimes, it depends when we have extreme samples, but so in this example, I have two arms with uh, a red and a blue uh, posterior. Um, arm one, so the red one is the best, and then I'll just draw one sample from each, so theta one, theta two, and here I have to play arm one because theta one is larger than theta two. But from this picture, you understand the exploration mechanism because of the randomness. Sometimes the red arm will sample in its left tail while the blue arm sample in its right tail. And this is the mechanism that makes you select all the arm uh, infinitely often. So for Gaussian distribution, we also have a very uh, closed form for the posterior that we need to sample from in uh, the algorithm. So often people use an improper prior so that the posterior distribution on each arm is a Gaussian whose mean is exactly the maximum likelihood estimator and whose variance is uh, in uh, one over the number of observations. You can also use a Gaussian prior and have some, uh, some biased uh, version. But so this is just to say that for the simple bandit model, it's really an easy algorithm. You sample from a, a well-known uh, distribution. And also, depending on the distribution, you instantiate different priors, so it's different uh, algorithm. <coughs> so what is known, in, uh, uh, theoretically speaking, about uh, Thompson sampling is uh, quite recent compared to all, all the algorithm is. And what we have now in the literature is a tight bound on the expected number of times the algorithm draws uh, suboptimal selection. And so the bounds, if I play the bandit algorithm up to t times step, um, I know that I will draw the bad arm at most log t time divided by uh, some constant here expressed as the KL divergence between uh, the arm with mean mu A and the arm with mean uh, mu star. And what is, so this has been proved first for Bernoulli bandits and now it's also proved for Gaussian bandits and more generally for one dimensional exponential family, but it's proved for say simple parametric uh, family where actually the, the mean completely characterizes the, the distribution. And for such distributions, there was actually already a known lower bound since uh, 1985. It was proved by Lyon Robbins, saying that indeed any algorithm that has a small regret for all possible uh, bandit model, this is what I mean by a good algorithm, any algorithm needs to draw at as much as log t divided by uh, KL of mu a mu star, uh, each suboptimal arm. So this is telling that uh, Thompson sampling is matching 
uh, this, this lower bound. So somehow the, uh, the, the problem is solved in a super asymptotic fashion for simple uh, parametric uh, bandits. So this scale, the way we prove lower bounds, so those are using some information theoretic tool, but this scale of mu a mu star can be interpreted as the distance between the current bandit model and the closest model in which you make arm A better than the optimal arm. And uh, this, uh, this KL uh, accounts for this transportation cost between the two, uh, the two models. So this is why we, we got this uh, information theoretic complexity. Uh, so I presented you one bandit algorithm, which I like a lot, this uh, Thomson sampling on the left, but frequentist uh, people have also proposed very nice uh, bandit algorithms that share in common the need to incorporate uncertainty instead of just uh, using estimation. And the way they encode uncertainty is by using confidence interval in the Bayesian uh, world. And so the resulting algorithm is called a UCB algorithm, where instead of picking the arm with largest empirical mean, you pick the arm with largest upper confidence bound uh, on, uh, on its means. But what I want to highlight on this slide is the fact that both family of algorithms need to then be tuned depending on what kind of reward you are facing. So as I already show you, you pick different posteri prior posterior distribution depending on what you know you will, uh, you will uh, gather. Uh, and in UCB, it's the same. To build upper confidence bond, you use concentration inequalities. And depending on the, the observed, um, the sample data, you will use different concentration inequality leading to a different expression of the algorithm in the end. So what if uh, we consider the simplest family of non-parametric distribution, uh, which consists in uh, the distribution that have bounded support in uh, some interval. So this incorporates in particular Bernoulli multinomial, but uh, any possible distribution. Actually, with the UCB family, it's very easy to uh, use concentration inequality tailored to bounded uh, distribution like Öfding and get a closed form uh, expression of an algorithm tailored for this bounded, uh, bounded family. For Thomson sampling, it's a little bit less clear. So it's true that we could use some kind of binarization trick. Like we take our bounded data, we renormalize, then we have data in zero one and we just replace the reward by a binary re reward with the same expectation by uh, sampling a uniform. So we can do stuff, but what I want to do now is do stuff optimally also for this non-parametric class. And so this brings me to this very nice uh, non-parametric Thomson sampling, which was proposed in uh, 2020 by, um, uh, by Junia Honda and uh, one of his uh, students. And my motivation for this is coming back to this problem in agriculture. So this is the type of distribution we are facing when we try to recommend planting date to farmer. So here we have uh, four curves which correspond to four arms. So the arms are different planting dates. And uh, the, the, what, what is plotted here is the, estimation, the estimated density of uh, the distribution of the yield depending on the different planting dates. So this, this uh, data was simulated using some uh, simulator, using uh, historical data for farming in Africa for 30 years. It's a simulator called uh, DSAT that uh, uh, my colleague Odalric worked, worked a lot on. And so we see that, okay, yield, amount of grain per year is naturally bounded. However, we have this uh, complex shape, and so it would be nice to have an algorithm that probably adapts to this uh, complex uh, distribution. So what I need to define is what it is to be optimal in a possibly complex non-parametric family. Indeed, the first lower bound I showed you before was applying to simple parametric distribution that are completely characterized by their means, which is not the case for the distribution I just showed you. But it turns out it is also possible to derive an information theoretic lower bound uh, when you want to, to have an algorithm which performs well 
for any uh, reward distribution in some arbitrary family D. So D is just some set of distribution. Uh, for our talk, this set will be all distributions supported on an interval uh, 0B. And then what changes is before we had a simple KL divergence between the distribution of arm A and the distribution of uh, the best arm. Here we have a quantity which still uses KL divergence, but it is expressed as the smallest uh, KL divergence between uh, arm A and an an arm in this class that has the largest mean than the optimal arm. So just, okay, it's a more complicated quantity, but it's still possible actually to design algorithms that are matching this lower bound for bounded distribution. And it was already known since uh, like 10 years how to do that with the UCB approach, but not really with the Thompson sampling uh, approach. And so this is a nice idea of uh, uh, non-parametric Thomson sampling. So it's the same kind of algorithm. So we will draw one parameter theta for each arm and place the argmax. And the way theta is done is, uh, as a non-parametric method, it will use all the previous uh, data observed. So we cannot really summarize things with a sufficient statistic like in the, the posterior, but we can still leverage the whole history and the index computed in non-parametric Thomson sampling is um, a random reweighting of the, the history of previous rewards. So we have gathered some rewards. Then we draw a random uh, probability. So if we have NAT rewards, we draw a random probability vector supported on NAT plus one points, because actually it's very important for the algorithm to work to add in the history of collected data the knowledge of the upper bound. And uh, so we, we randomize, uh, so we, we choose random uh, weights uni like uniformly in the, in the simplex, which amounts to drawing the, the weights from a Dirichlet distribution with a, uh, a lot of ones. And so the way uh, Ryu and Honda introduced this algorithm in 2020, they first presented it as an extension of what you do in the multinomial case. That is when you have only a finite uh, number of possible uh, rewards. In that case, you, you put a Dirichlet prior and have a Dirichlet posterior. And then uh, they, they go to uh, what happens when, for example, you have continuous distribution where all the points are, are different. So it's a bit their philosophy to come up with the algorithm. But actually, you can also know that I presented this talk with more statistical audience. So the one uh, who are experts on bootstrap tell, tell me that this is called the Bayesian bootstrap, up to the fact that we need to add B, like this idea of producing an estimate, which is a random reweighting of uh, what's in your history. And people knowing Bayesian non-parametrics tell me, OK, this is putting a Dirichlet prior sorry, a Dirichlet process on the, the possible uh, distribution, and so this would amount to sampling a Dirichlet process. So you have plenty of interpretation of this uh, uh, algorithm, but its analysis is quite intricate, and so this guy managed to prove that it is matching my uh, previous uh, complicated uh, lower bound on uh, the number of times the algorithm plays suboptimal. So what I want to do now is to use this algorithm for my application to farming, where actually I will have an additional constraint. So as I already argued, it's a particular example of complex bounded distribution, so where we know at least a crude upper bound on the maximal uh, yield. But actually, for, uh, if you want to recommend planting day to farmer, uh, uh, depending on uh, how well they can cope with bad years, maybe some of them would be interested in having less risky uh, decision. And here, it's a natural use case of this uh, conditional value at risk that Bob uh, talked about uh, before. So here is a formula I was mentioning as uh, uh, the supremum of something involving expectation. But So he was also talking about losses. So I'm talking about reward. So I will average the lower part instead of the larger part of the distribution. But the simplest way to interpret the SEVA, in my view, is the expectation of the random variable conditionally to the fact that we are smaller than uh, some uh, quantile. 
And if we have discrete distribution, it's, it's really also the same. We are uh, taking the na an average, but all the mass that is above the, qu the quantile, we, we just put it back to, uh, to something smaller. So it's really this idea of uh, averaging only the, the lower part. And so if you have a small alpha, it means that you want to be good in the bad years, in my farming example, which can be important for someone who is really trying to live out of his uh, harvests. Uh, whereas if you have, uh, if you have a bigger uh, uh, ability to manage risk, like you have a larger farm, so a market-oriented farmer might, be, might want to set a larger alpha. And uh, as Bob were already pointing out, you can recover the standard optimization of the mean by, so in my uh, reward case, by taking an alpha equal 100%, then you are exactly optimizing the average. So alpha is really a parameter that you set, but depending on the alpha, you might end up with a different optimal arm. So now uh, the quality of the arm will not be measured by its expectation, but I, I will try to discover or play as much as possible the arm with largest uh, CVAR. And so in this example, the best arm on expectation was arm uh, uh, 87. So this is the uh, uh, green curve. Whereas actually when we look at smaller value of the CVAR, the orange curve uh, is, uh, is better. So now how do we optimize CVAR regret? What I will argue is that we can do a simple modification of non-parametric Thompson sampling for this uh, CVAR uh, regret. So the way CVAR regret is defined, so there are different ways to define risk averse bandits. This I think is probably the, the simplest. Is before we wanted to try to minimize the sum of uh, instantaneous errors measured with the means. Here we just measure our error with the difference between the CVAR of the chosen arm and the CVAR of the best possible arm which also then boils down to controlling how much time we will select suboptimal arms. And it's quite easy to extend this complex non-parametric lower bound to this alternative, um, uh, alternative criterion. Here we end up some, with something very similar expressed as uh, an infimum over uh, KL divergence. But here the constraint, instead of being I'm trying to change an arm so as its mean is above the best mean, I will change the, the arm so that the CVAR is above uh, the best CVAR, something like that. So we also have an information theoretic lower bound on the number of time an algorithm minimizing the CVAR regret uh, should sample all the suboptimal arm. And as for the algorithm, the way we, so we introduced this uh, modification of um, non-parametric Thompson sampling called uh, B for bounded uh, CVAR Thompson sampling. So it is of the same flavor. It is producing a randomized index that I call here uh, CAT for each arm. It is also leveraging this uh, augmented history. But in order to cope with uh, this risk aver criterion, uh, we, we kind of reinterpret reinterpret the, the non-parametric Thompson sampling as producing a perturbation of the empirical CDF. So a possible index for the CVAR problem would be to form my empirical CDF and compute the CVAR of the empirical CDF. But what I, go, what I do instead is I form this uh, uh, perturbed CDF F tilde, which is uh, obtained by uh, randomly re-rating all the samples uh, using this completely random uh, uh, vector. And then I compute the CVAR of a discrete distribution for this empirical mean. So uh, if alpha equal one, computing the mean of an empirical CDF, it's really doing the average. But when alpha is strictly smaller than one, then I have to resort to CVAR computation. So, so the key to do the extension is really this reinterpretation as, okay, I have my data, I could compute the standard empirical CDF, but I'm not doing that. I'm completely rewriting at random all the observation that I get to, to uh, transform the, the CDF. And actually this philosophy, you could uh, transpose it to any other risk measure than the CVAR, like all these uh, uh, spectral risk measure or what uh, Bob talked about uh, before. 
However, in order to prove what we managed to prove for the, for the CVAR, that uh, the expected number of suboptimal selection scales optimally with log t divided by the right information theoretic constant, to do that, we have to be able to control what we call uh, boundary crossing probabilities. So this is really a, uh, what we, we need to control. So for the algorithm to behave well, we need to justify that uh, the, the CVAR uh, based on the sample are ordered in the right way so that we end up playing most of the time the, the, the best arm. And so to do so, so, a proxy is to check when this CVAR formed with random weights exceed some, uh, some threshold. And so th this quantity, the boundary crossing probability, is really the randomness is on the vector W, which is drawn uh, at random on endpoints. And we need to control the probability that this CVAR uh, for a fixed support and random weights exceed a threshold. And to make our analysis work, we needed to prove lower and upper bound on this quantity. And we needed them to scale with this k-in function. So here, u of y is a uniform distribution on my support. So uh, it's, uh, when y is the data you just observed, this would be your uh, empirical CDF somehow. And so uh, this was the, the difficulty of the analysis. So I'm not uh, giving you the, the precise detail on how we do that, but it's not easy to extend to, to any uh, risk measure. And so far, the CVAR is the only one for which there are guarantees. So other people have tried other risk measures, but in the end, we realize their analysis only applied to the CVAR. So if you are interested in other uh, risk measures, there are still some uh, uh, challenge here. And so just to tell you, because I didn't tell you before, but the reason people got really interested in Thompson sampling is that it works really well. Like when it was rediscovered for Bandit, it was tried also in more complex situation. And also in reinforcement learning, it gives uh, exploration uh, heuristic. But like for problem in a recommendation, it got really good performance. And the same is true actually in this particular uh, example. So our competitors are algorithms that comes from this uh, UCB families. And interestingly, in the literature, there is different ways to form UCB uh, on the CVAR. The first one, so they both rely on some concentration inequality, but the, the first one will take the CVAR of the empirical distribution and add it something, some bonus, which is uh, uh, so that this UCB is indeed larger than uh, the CVAR. And the second approach that was proposed is to instead build an optimistic version of the function uh, of the CDF and then compute the CDF of this function. And actually, both approaches, so here, uh, this table display uh, the regret after uh, horizon t equal to, to 10 to the fourth uh, in our uh, DSAT experiment. And we see that the regret of this uh, Siva Thompson sampling approach is much smaller than uh, uh, any of the two uh, UCP. And so this is a regret curve version where we monitor the regret uh, as a function of time uh, averaged over um, many simulations for two different values of the alpha parameter inside the, the SIVA. So the algorithm is working well. And another nice feature is that the bound B that you need to feed it uh, on the support, it's quite robust actually to have a large misspecification of this, uh, this quantity. This is also a, a nice property of the, the algorithm. Okay, so I have uh, like 15 minutes maybe to talk about the, uh, the second part. So I, I might uh, have to go a bit fast and skip, uh, skip the end, but I just wanted to go back a little bit to the other problem. Like now we know an algorithm to um, gather a lot of rewards when we interact with possibly non-parametric uh, distribution. And a natural question is, out of it, can we make an, an algorithm to find the best arm? So just uh, first, how do we formalize this problem of finding the best arm uh, in the literature? So the component that doesn't change is uh, we need this adaptive sampling rule to collect data. So this is still uh, 80, the arm chosen by the algorithm for exploration 
uh, at time t. But then we also need to make a guess for what we think is the best arm given what we observed so far. So this guess is called my recommendation rule and I will denote it by bt. And then you can frame the problem as trying to stop the exploration when you have found the best arm. This is what I call the uh, stopping rule. And so in the literature, there, are, there have been two kinds of formalization. Either you, have given, you are given a maximal budget T and then you want to try to minimize the probability that you make an error in identifying the best arm. Or you are given a maximal error delta and you try to uh, reach this precision using as few samples as, uh, as possible. So those are my two performance measures, and I worked a bit more on the, the second one, the fixed uh, confidence cell. <clears throat> so what, what do we do for the Thompson sampling? How do we propose the guess for the arm BT that, was, uh, that we think is the best arm? Well, we just proved that Thompson sampling is most of the time drawing the best arm, why don't we just say, okay, my best arm is the arm that has been sampled the most by Thompson sampling? Because we know there is this T versus log T sam sampling between the optimal arm and uh, the best arm. Actually, a, a very related idea, but slightly easier to analyze, is to say, okay, I will output a guess at random, but proportionally to how many times this, uh, this arm has been drawn uh, so far. And so it's very easy to uh, compute the estimation error, say, of this strategy, which is the expectation of uh, mu star minus the mu of the arm that is recommended. So because of this uh, random sampling scheme, it will be uh, the sum of mu star minus mu a multiplied by so the probability to output mu, uh, mu a, which is uh, nat divided by t meaning that actually this is exactly the regret divided by t. It means that if I have an algorithm with small regrets, and if I recommend this bt at random according to what the algorithm has been uh, doing, I'm guaranteed to have an error that decays. So this is nice, but sadly it is not at all solving my best time identification problem in an optimal way, because actually if you do uniform sampling, when you have no constraint to maximize reward, you can prove that this error decays exponentially fast. So uh, we are not uh, guaranteed to be, uh, to be good with a regret minimizing algorithm. And actually there are very nice results in the literature, well, maybe not for practitioner, but at least in theory, saying that if you have a good regret minimizer, you cannot actually solve optimally. Uh, so there is theorem saying the larger uh, the smaller the regret, the larger the error, something like that. So this is just to motivate that, okay, there need specific tools to solve a best arm identification problem. And actually, what I liked is this fix of Thompson sampling for uh, best arm identification that was proposed by uh, Dan Rousseau in uh, uh, 2016. It can be interpreted in the following. Okay, Thompson sampling is just sampling too much the, the best arm, we will just, with some probability, force it to do something else. So the algorithm introduced is called top two Thompson sampling. And uh, the idea is that, so um, you start by a Thompson sampling step. So you sample a possible uh, bandit model from this posterior distribution. Then uh, A star of theta is the best arm in the sampled model. This is what Thompson sampling would play. So with some probability beta, you actually let your algorithm do Thomson sampling. So you play this uh, A star of theta. And then with probability one minus de beta, you resample your posterior until it outputs a different arm. And you play that arm. So it, it may be viewed as trying to uh, force Thomson sampling to do, uh, to do something else. And uh, interestingly, so the, the way uh, Dan Russo analyzed this algorithm is is not with the standard, uh, the tool I presented before, so he provides some Bayesian guarantees. He, he, he exhibits, the, um, he looks at the rate at which, the, like the posterior probability of the, the set of uh, wrong answers, and he shows that this decays at some rate. And what is really, what was funny to us at the moment is that 
this quantity T star of beta mu inside its optimal decay of the posterior, it happens to also be the lower bound we just proved on the sample complexity of this fixed confidence best arm identification algorithm. So the lower bound, so this term looks really uh, ugly, but um, uh, okay, so there is the extra beta also in, uh, in the top two Thompson sampling, the probability uh, with which you follow uh, Thompson sampling. And so the lower bound for best arm identification tells you that if you want to identify the best arm with an error at most delta, you need uh, T star of nu times log one over delta sample at the minimum. So this is what the lower bound says. And so uh, the, the R T star could be seen as the minimum over beta of uh, the, the quantity featured in, uh, in Russo's analysis. And naturally, we try to dig a bit into, uh, uh, into why... Okay, the person who lent me the PC has no battery. <laughs> so I will have a hard, uh, a hard stop in, in 10 minutes. <clears throat> so just uh, one word. So the, the shape of this T is not really of interest here, but it can be viewed, it can be interpreted as here we get a, a supremum over possible allocation. So decay is the simplex of size K. The W represents the fraction of time you would sample each of the arm. And so uh, this quantity here, uh, they represent what we, what we call the, the transportation cost, is the number of samples needed to verify that a particular arm cannot be optimal. So in the previous formula, we, we see these scale divergence that are related to transportation costs. Here, I don't really want to dig too much into this. I just want to follow a bit more the uh, algorithmic uh, approach. <coughs> and so, uh, given the similarity of, like, given this T star appearing in both top two Thompson sampling and our lower bound for uh, fixed confidence best arm identification, what we did in a, in a first uh, paper was to actually analyzed top two Thomson sampling for uh, fixed confidence best arm identification. And so at the beginning, we managed to do it only in the simplest uh, Gaussian case, uh, where here the posterior is, uh, so this uh, normal posterior with mean, the empirical mean and with variance uh, one over NA. And in that case, when we couple the algorithm with a stopping rule which was commonly used when we want to do fixed confidence uh, best arm identification, we managed to prove that indeed we get an upper bound on the, the quantity, uh, on the sample complexity, on the time it takes to stop when we use this top two Thomson sampling rule together with the common uh, sampling rule used, sorry, stopping rule used at the time. And so, this, uh, this stopping rule for statisticians, here you might recognize a generalized likelihood ratio uh, statistic in order to, to test whether uh, mu a is larger than uh, uh, mu of the current uh, empirical best arm. <coughs> but okay, the, the details are not very important here. So here we get a T star of beta, so we are not exactly matching the lower bound. But what Russo proved is that actually, if you choose the beta parameter with which you follow or not follow a Thompson sampling to be equal to one half, actually you are guaranteed to never been worse than two times the, the best possible choice of, uh, of beta. So we end up with an algorithm that is uh, within a factor two of the minimal sample complexity we can get for a best arm identification. And so since then, we've extended a bit this idea of top two algorithm, which is originally inspired by this Bayesian philosophy of uh, uh, not letting Thomson sampling uh, do what it wants, to any possible, uh, uh, possibly non-Bayesian uh, algorithm that would use this uh, top two ID, this idea of finding two possible arms and then decided with probability beta to go with one and with probability one minus beta to go with the other. And so in the general top two uh, algorithm, we define a leader, 
BT, which will sometimes be also our guess for the best arm, a challenger CT, and then we draw one of the two arms with this probability. So in top two Thompson sampling, we have an example of this top two structure where the leader is, uh, a Thompson, is given by a Thompson sampling scheme, whereas the challenger is uh, given by this uh, resampling scheme of finding under a posterior a configuration that gives a different best arm. But the drawback of this is that actually the resampling step can be super costly. Because when your posterior distribution starts to be concentrated, when you have drawn enough the arm, you have to resample for a very long time in order to find, actually, like to sample from this conditional distribution to find a configuration that is not the same as the one given by your current best arm. So, uh, also, uh, Thompson sample is only used in a parametric setting. So, <coughs> we did is to replace first this resampling by something computationally efficient. And actually, the, uh, the motivation we had in the, um, uh, in the Gaussian case was to say, OK, the, the probability that the resampling step output an arm is actually proportional to the probability that the posterior probability that this arm is uh, optimal. And when the leader is, say, uh, the, the best arm, this probability is roughly the probability that arm A exceeds the, the, the theta of the best arm. And in the Gaussian case, this is the probability that one Gaussian exceeds another. You can derive a computation uh, upper and lower bound on this. And actually, it is scaling with uh, this quantity in, uh, in purple. So the squared gap between the empirical mean uh, divided by this function of the number of draws. And if you remember well, this is also very close to what was in our, uh, in our stopping work. And so the strategy we proposed out of this computation is, OK, wait, don't resample. Just choose the mode of this distribution. So choose the arm which minimizes then what is inside my, uh, my exponent. And as it happens, this can be reinterpreted as if you look at the currently used stopping rule for the problem, you are just going to pick the one that, has, that is realizing the minimum, so that, will, that has a chance to make your stopping rule trigger uh, faster. And so this is called the transportation cost interpretation of this alternative to, uh, uh, to resampling. And actually, you can do the same also in non-parametric families, where you also have this equivalent of uh, transportation cost. And when, for example, for bounded distribution, we are able to uh, show that a good stomping rule is also of this, uh, of this form. <coughs> and so uh, what we did in a, in a recent paper with, uh, with Marc Jourdan is to analyze all kinds of combination of leader and challenger. And interestingly, we the one we recommend to use in the end is not necessarily of a Bayesian flavor because of, in a non-parametric setting, the cost of sampling. So we could sample also with this Dirichlet mechanism I presented in the first part of the talk, but it's actually, numerically speaking, crazily costly. And so what we end up recommending is to choose as a leader this uh, just taking the empirical best arm, because empirical means are easy to compute. And for the challenger, uh, we recommend to use this uh, TCI, so transportation cost improved, so uh, to um, choose the arm that has the smallest tr transportation cost with respect to our current leader, and adding a little penalization to enforce some exploration. So we started from a Bayesian algorithm, and then maybe our current recommendation would be to use a, a frequentist one. Uh, so yeah, what, what, Mark, uh, what we did with Mark is really a, a generic analysis that identifies what are the properties needed for a leader, what are the properties needed for a challenger, and then just using an application of this general analysis, we managed to show that uh, those algorithms work under very different uh, assumptions on the rewards, including this bounded uh, non-parametric class I was uh, discussing in the first part uh, of the talk. 
And so I will just conclude maybe with uh, experiments on this. Um, so this is a renormalized version of my uh, DSAT distribution that uh, I showed you. And so this is uh, the, um, a box plot for the distribution of the sample complexity needed in order to uh, output the, the best arm. So we see that the four uh, top two algorithms that we propose perform uh, quite well. And so for this problem, for this bounded distribution in best arm identification, there, there was no pr previous work that was exactly matching our lower bound, but there existed some algorithms that uh, are at least guaranteed to have some sample complexity bounds. And so we are uh, outperforming this uh, UCB type, uh, LUCB type based of algorithm. And here on the right, we have uh, uniform sampling. So the algorithms are indeed uh, working. So I will skip the other experiments and just jump to the conclusion. So what I try to convey is that, okay, Thompson sampling is a cool algorithm for maximizing reward. It has optimal property in uh, classic parametric classes. It can also be extended as a nice algorithm for this uh, set of bounded uh, distribution. And it can also tackle easily other performance criterion, like uh, the SIVA regret. And then uh, for it also inspired a nice algorithm for solving the best arm identification problem, which can be uh, abstracted and lead to this new family of uh, uh, top two algorithms, which are very nice, both in theory and practice. And they are, in particular, they have a property that few algorithms have, is that the, the way the sampling rule does not depend at all on the parameter delta that we fix for the risk. So as such, that could be used, uh, and we could try to prove uh, something which is mentioned as my perspective. So what would be the performance of this algorithm? Like, could we prove something on how the, the error uh, in identifying the, the best arm decay with time? And so the fact that those algorithms are any time make them a good candidate for uh, any time learning of the, the best arm. But, so this is actually, in the end, a bit tricky. But. Okay, I'll stop here with a few, uh, a few uh, references and thank you for your attention. If there are some questions, we are ready to throw you the microphone. Uh, thank you for the talk. Wow, it's very loud. Um, so I, I really like the part where you showed that this can be extended to the conditional value at risk. And one thing I was thinking is, does your implementation or algorithm also allow for the incorporation of context to make it a contextual arm bandit yeah. in order to estimate the conditional probability? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So here I only mentioned the, the simplest possible bandit problem where the decision just depends on past observation, but indeed, <coughs> Uh, a natural extension is this contextual bandit where in each round you observed like some information of the user you want to make recommendation on. In particular, in the agricultural context, it makes sense like weather forecast or what you know uh, uh, about the type of, uh, of exploitation. So indeed, it's a natural extension. And so uh, my student Dorian is working with people in agriculture mm -hmm. to make a contextual version. I don't know if they are also taking the SIVA into account, but uh, yeah, indeed, this could, uh, this could, I guess, be... So, so it could, but do the results extend to that case, or is it... No, 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 there is very few results. So there is some results for Thompson sampling in contextual bandit without SIVA, mm -hmm. but they are quite weak in the sense that the algorithm which is analyzed is not the one that you would want to use in mm -hmm. practice. So for the proof, you need to, like, inflate the variance of the posterior by something that is really hurting the practical yeah. performance. So I guess, yeah, we would have the same problem to analyze the SIVA version of contextual Thompson sampling. Cool, thank you. So, Peter? Uh, 
Uh, yeah, thank you. <coughs> Sorry. Thank you for a very nice uh, talk. Uh, I, I guess it's CVAR day because I also have questions about that. So <laughs> I'm wondering, maybe I don't understand CVAR well enough, but if you go, to, for example, to this 20 per, alpha is 20% case, isn't there a risk that uh, because you're conditioning on some, you're basically conditioning on bad years there, yeah. right? So isn't there... Yeah. Uh, a risk that you start recommending something which on the 80% of better years will actually also be pretty bad, whereas you something so that you are kind of moving everything in the other 80% very much towards that 20% in behavior. So I'm wondering, isn't it like too, too conditional somehow? Yeah, then you would set a different alpha maybe. <laughs> no, no, I, I agree that the philosophy is really... Um, to try to maximize the, the, the outcome in the worst 20% of the year. And I guess in practice, people, they compute alpha depending on how much they would afford to lose on the, on the bad years. But uh, yeah, I have no good sense on... Yeah, maybe... Uh, okay, a, then it is how I thought it was. But it's a bit, maybe like in, in, uh, coming back to Bob's talk, it's a bit like... An economist saying like, okay, we really have to make sure that the 20% purse of the population that we're optimizing for those and the 80% others will then be just as bad off as those 20%, right? That, that could happen in principle. So maybe you need some mix somehow. Yeah, from I, I think it's possible C to, to consider something alternative, like maximize the expectation conditionally to the fact that the 20% CVAR Something is, like that, yeah. Yeah, I think it has been proposed in a recent paper, but uh, I, and I think you could apply possibly Thompson something to that too. Uh, could you? Well, maybe it's not obvious, but... Uh, but yeah, definitely we could, we can come up with, there is a, a large literature on risk averse bandit, which I'm not familiar of about mm -hmm. everything, but I think I saw something in the line you suggest, right. like constraint with the risk measure, but still taking yeah. into account expectation among reasonable. Exactly. Yeah, that seems very reasonable to me. Yep. But, yeah. So maybe because it's CVAR day, I also got inspired to... <laughs> ask about it. So uh, when you turn to CVAR, you set the objective for your algorithm to sample most of the time the arm with the best CVAR. Indeed. I guess if you would take CVAR as an alternative to expectation, maybe you would instead like to think of the CVAR of your cumulative Some reward, for example. Yep. What would happen if you try to go that route so people have tried. Uh, there is a paper, I don't remember by whom, but uh, okay, the paper where they propose a UUCB algorithm. They consider the generic notion of regret as the risk measure of the sum of trajectory. And in the end, I think they, they prove that, uh, okay, so it's paper by Cassel et al. Uh, they also consider a notion called a proxy regret somewhere that correspond a bit to just finding the arm that like sampling a lot the arm that has the largest risk and they show some connection like if you optimize the proxy regret then you get something for the other regret not something optimal and honestly i don't know how to get something optimal when your criterion is try to minimize like maximize the cvar of the sum of rewards uh, i don't remember how they I'm not even sure they solved this problem, but they discuss different formalization of what is risk averse bandits that, that are interesting. All right, any last questions? So I don't see any. So in that case, let's give another round of applause for Emily. Thank you.